G'day, I'm David Williams from CFA. Today I'm going to speak to two authors, Neil Grant and Adrian Highland. Adrian Highland's book, King Lake 350, is a remarkable story of survival and heroism on Australia's worst bushfire disaster, Black Saturday. Highland argues that our failure to engage with fire is a failure of our culture. He suggests that we're too connected to our computer screens and not connected enough to our environment. He also asks, can we learn from history? Highland himself is doubtful. I remain optimistic, and certainly both of us remain hopeful. Adrian, your book is a great achievement. How did you come to write it? I, I, I didn't actually set out to write the book. I, I, like, the first thing I should say is that um, because we knew so many people who died in the fires, and particularly for me, the probably the most important thing was why I felt so emotionally involved, I think, was because my youngest daughter was at Strathewan Primary School. They had gone through Strathewan and all of her primary school. And we had, we said, although we don't live in, we live in St Andrews, but um, we felt probably more of an emotional attachment to Strathew, or as much anyway, and um, you just sort of build up those friendships and relationships through your children's school. So we were felt, like everybody I suppose, pretty emotionally ravaged by it. And um, yes, I, I suppose I, I actually didn't feel I, I wrote a few articles and things, one of which was, a, for example, about, my, about, about the Strathewan School and the teacher's amazing um, it, yeah, efforts in getting that school open just a couple of days after, the, after it burned down, which was a pretty amazing thing. Um, but I, I, felt, I, I certainly couldn't imagine writing a book about it, but I, some, yeah, one, well, one of them, so it began maybe just talking to Roger Wood, who's a friend of mine, who's a fellow parent at Strathfield, and he's also a neighbour of mine, lives along Butterman's Track in St Andrews, and our daughters are both very good friends. And, yeah, various people f who'd been directly either endangered or threatened, who sort of felt they owed him at either a, uh, a debt of gratitude on some cases their lives, just for the way he and his colleagues sort of ran around responding on that day. Um, yeah, people just sort of told me little glimpses of that story, and I don't think R Roger was in a position to sort of talk about it himself for a while either. But gradually over that year, when we sort of he, he was injured on the on the day and in the follow up, and just sort of over over a few discussions we had in the course of those six or eight months after the fires. Um, I had to, that maybe I might write a small article just sort of outlining his day, and then somehow just like it just it just seemed such a massive sort of thing. It just just sort of kept growing in my head, and particularly from Roger to you know, if you're really going to, uh, he was a bit extremely reluctant initially. He said, "Look, if you're going to talk about me, like there were these people from the CFA doing this who we worked with and SES, and I sort of built up a bit of a picture of the whole day, and." Um, Sort of just through his conversation, through this conversation so I had with him, and so somewhere in there, it, it sort of grew from wanting to just tell his story to, to the idea that maybe in telling his story and putting it into a broader context, I could one pay tribute to all the emergency services people who were you know out there working. You know, trying to save lives in many cases while they were losing their own homes and two try to come to some understanding of it which is sort of what you do as an artist I reckon you, and, that, and that's where I sort of had these ideas of trying to weave in the science and the ecological history and the even the psychology and the cultural history and those sort of things yeah. so it just sort of grew I suppose and in summary maybe maybe about a year after the fire I thought oh, I think I'll actually make this a book a, I was particularly struck when I heard about some of the fire. Like I joined the CFA very soon after the fires, and particularly meeting some of the people at our own brigade in St Andrews. Yes, but particularly some of the people I met from King Lake, who'd lost their own homes while they were out. You know, I just felt quite very, very touched by that, and and, and quite a few. There was quite a few people from St Andrews who had lost their homes or had their families threatened and gone through a traumatic experience. 
And I just felt, I think I felt compelled to do it. Yeah. And I know I had no idea it would actually be published as a book. And um, I, yes, I just, just decided to write it, whether it would be, and I had this, I thought I might maybe self publish it or yeah. do it as a series of magazine articles or something like that if, if no one else wanted to touch it. Yeah. My basic technique was to first just make the initial approach. In some cases, people approached me. Um, who'd heard I was doing it, so look, can I just add this bit to that and that, and you know, it might have been, particularly in the CFA, a little bit of a sort of a network there. Someone hears that you're doing it and so they just, uh, and they sort of get back in touch with you. Um, my basic approach was to interview people, and then I would transcribe the interview, show it to them, and then I would rewrite their story, and again I'd show it to them. And there were, a lot of, I mean, in every case, I was just, it's in, actually it's interesting to reflect upon how many things I got wrong just from people's, you know, just misunderstanding what people were saying. And I've, I think basically, what, from what little I've seen of, you know, journalism and non-fiction writing, it seems the closer you know a story, the more likely you are to get, the more likely you are to get things wrong. You know, but, I mean, the closer you, are, the closer you are to a story, the more you'll notice things that they've got wrong. So I basically did, just sort of write out the stories and I'd show it to them and then I'd get them to um, to give me their feedback. And, and many, in it, almost every case, there was you know, dozens and dozens of changes. As a novelist, were you were you sort of tempted to write a fictional account to try and bring all these things to bear within a, a, a fiction? I mean, I, I, I can talk see about genre, yeah, because I, I can see how you've I can see how you've used it's definitely you've used a novelist approach. In a non-fiction sense, you've taken yeah. Roger Wood as a protagonist. Yeah, I have. Yeah, and put him through the. That's sort of the only way I know how to work, really. I've sort of. I mean, I did. Obviously, I'm particularly my crime writing. I try and bring some of those, uh, uh, some of those techniques. I left things hanging here and there, and you know, a lot of it's in the crafting of a single sentence. I've had people ask me, "What's the difference between writing non-fiction and fiction?" And to me, there isn't a huge in the craftsmanship. There isn't a huge amount of difference, but. Of course, in social relationships, in ethics, and those sort of things, there's a, there's a lot of differences mm. now. And I've, I mean, basically, all these people, almost all of the main characters, are my friends, and I sort of told their stories. Um, I did approach some people on sort of Roger's uh, suggestion. People who didn't know, but who I sort of got to know over the course of the book, who who were happy to have their stories told. Um, but if, in regard to the fiction, non-fiction thing, a lot of people, there are a lot of things I knew that I didn't want to put in the book or else sometimes people had given me their stories and were initially happy to proceed but then changed their minds for some reason, um, for very understandable reasons. And of course, so in those situations, I just, just pulled them out of the mm. book completely. I was really just trying to capture the stories of a handful of people who I knew. And... Um, writing something which I hope would be in honour of all of the people. And e even that, that even goes as far as the um, you know, some of the stories I wrote of the people who were the victims. So many times I drove back from King Lake you know, with tears in my eyes, just some Absolutely. of the things that, things that people had told me. But luck, it, was luck, it seems to often have been a matter of luck whether you survived. I mean, preparation obviously had a lot to do with it. You, you guys both know this better than I would be. King Lake people, but uh, you know, we all. We, I mean, I heard stories of people who were brilliantly prepared, who perished, and others who sort of, you know, broke every rule in the book and bumbled around and did wrong things and came out untouched. You know, so so much luck and depend on when you know, when the wind changed, what it was doing. Um, yeah, but I must admit, there's there's not to deny the importance of preparation. Yeah, for the same time, I got. People I know who are involved in fire guard groups, you know, feel that having been in those fire guard groups saved their lives and you know, some of the preparations they took. And I remember one woman I describe in the book, you know, she's she's taken when the she's taken every precaution possible, got the beautifully prepared house, they got pumps and you know, gravity fed lines inside the house and the fire but then the fire's actually ram about to hit them and she's still sitting there thinking just from thinking this can't be happening, this isn't real, it's still not going to happen to me. And then it does. Mm. So as I said, odds, chance, luck, it all comes into it. Mm.
that lulls us into a false sense of security, I think, is part of the concern. Your chapter fire plan really illustrates how unprepared some really were, doesn't it? This is just a little scene which Roger Wood described to me on the morning of the fires when a woman came in who was new to the area and had no, uh, no idea about what fire plans were, what to do about fires, and she just asked him, should I be worried? And I've got this, I'll just quote, read from, read from uh, Rod uh, Wood scratches his head, it's truth. She lives in one of the most fire prone communities in the world. It's been hit by fire time and again in its 130 year history. Today is the worst forecast ever, and she doesn't know what a fire plan is, and she's asking if she should be worried. So I suppose I wanted to quote that as an example of just, you know, how we as a culture tend not to be very engaged with our, with our, with our environment. There were those who prepared and prepared well. They activated their fire plans. They had fire plans. Some left early, others arranged their defences. They primed the pumps, laid out the hoses, gave the property a final cleaner. But there were many more who did few, if any, of those things. There were some, even in positions of authority, who suspected that major conflagrations were a thing of the past. We were so much more sophisticated now. We had sky cranes and water bombers, improved communications, bigger, better trucks. And of course we had the internet. The CFA website gave you regularly updated summaries of all fires reported across the state. If there was any danger, surely the authorities would let you know. There was even talk that the drought itself had made a megafire unlikely, that after 12 years desiccation, there simply wasn't enough fuel left to sustain a monster fire. And if by any chance a fire does come, you know the routine. Let the main front pass, give it maybe 10 minutes, then nip outside, start up the pump if you've got one. If not, a mop and a bucket should do the trick. There was that fellow in Anglesey on Ash Wednesday back in 83 who saved his entire street with a mop and bucket. Extinguished the spots, remained vigilant, watch for further outbreaks. Way to go. <laughs> fire seems to appear as a character throughout the book. I think in some ways the fire is a character in the book. And again, that probably harks back to experiences with Aboriginal communities where they would have would have had that sort of idea of, of nature being that way. Um, I suppose, my, I, think I, 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 I think that section there we're talking about the change when the, when the, you know, the fire can sort of forms into these tornado type things and they can sort of come in, be coming at you from the back. That's where I was calling it a snake in the grass. Then I use the, the metaphor of it being a hydra-headed monster because I, um, which probably is more the fact that I did classics and Greek in my original degree than anything that than, than fire science. But these are some of the images that sort of spring to mind. You use very interesting language to describe fire throughout the book. Perhaps take us to a part which uh, shows this. We're describing the change now when, um, when different weather systems collide and the fire ground goes berserk. On the fire ground it's the horror moment, the slow-mo sequence, the snake rearing in the grass. If you, do think, if you do think of it as a reptile, it may help to imagine it as one that's suddenly transformed from a single slithering serpent into a hydra-headed monster. You make a point a number of times throughout the book about how people were looking at their computer screen and not being aware of what's happening outside. I mean, that's the thing that one of my, the images I got from talking to a lot of people involved in this thing was that people just seem so dependent upon technology that they were losing touch with their senses. This was actually one of the most astonishing, I, I'm still like, I mean, I'm sure it was, it was from Frank Allen, who's a very experienced and a fantastic lieutenant out of King Lake West, who contacted the Kangaroo Incident Control Centre at around 2pm to ask about the fire and he was stunned to realise that they didn't even know that, that they didn't, because it was still formally part of Kilmore's responsibility, the kangaroo ground people he spoke to didn't even seem to know about it and he just assumed that maybe they were so busy looking at their computer screens they hadn't actually stepped outside but of course that was an image I heard not so much from the CFA but from individuals 
through the whole of the community. I had lots of examples of people who's, you know, as I said, somewhere whose who's last contact with the outside world was via a computer screen, which told them that the fire that was coming over the hill and in fact about to kill them was um, still a, a, a grass and scrub fire back in Kilmore, 30 kilometres away. On page 143, you use imagination to describe a family caught in the bushfire, and it's quite powerful. You know, just I just tried to sort of imagine what it was like. Thinking. Only somebody who's lived through that dread-filled noise can begin to imagine what it's like. It's still kilometres away, but the air shakes and the trees shiver. The ground begins to vibrate. Cockroaches and ants scuttle for cover, disappear into cracks in the ground. Then it rips into your eardrums, your brain, into the depths of your being. Soon the rooms fill up with smoke, the alarms go nuts, the kids and the dogs go mad. The walls bubble, the ceilings glow, red ribbons run along the crossbeams, burst into open flame. You creep crab-like to the door. And by Christ, it's still too hot out there and you wonder when it'll be safe for you to go outside. The realisation falls on you like a cold hand, the one cold thing in this black hell. It never will be safe outside, not for you. Your life, the regrets, the joys, the unfinished business, the chances half taken, the words of love unspoken, the precious pitter-patter of irrelevance cavalcades through your head. Time storms and the blood stands still as you huddle under the blanket and gaze at each other in disbelief. You watch their faces twist, their eyelids grip, their foreheads red reflected pain. You stroke their hair, you tell them it'll be all right, and it will be. You kiss their devastated lips and pray that it will be quick. Your final chapter, Reflections, seems to be a personal essay. What were you trying to achieve in that chapter? I suppose I, I wrote the reflection, I, I, I just wanted to synthesise the, the thoughts and insights I'd had into fire during the course of the writing of the book, to think about what fire meant for us and, and for our culture and our future, particularly in the light of a change, the changing environment that we live in and also the demographics, so the fact that people are moving out into into the bush and it just struck me that the way the world is changing, the way our population is changing, it's a, it's a pretty important, it's just an important physical thing that we need to learn to live with and if we don't learn that not just fire but the environment itself, if we don't learn to respect it then ultimately there's no escaping of it, it's ultimately going to come around and come back and bite you. I'm really interested in what you say on page 245, then when the unthinkable occurs we search for scapegoats. It's all the fault of the CFA, the DSE, the local council, the tree changers, the police, the greenies. It's always somebody else. The accusing finger sweeps out, searching for a target. Only rarely does it turn back towards its owner. Yeah, that's how I feel, I suppose, that, the whole, that if we're going to live here, we just need to take it seriously and we can't... I mean, there are still people who seem to expect the fire truck's going to rock up and protect their house if, if, if a fire does come. I mean, when you think about a town like King Lake, you know, there's two fire trucks for you know, I don't know how many hundred houses there are there, but the only one you've really got to rely upon is yourself. And really, if you, for me, if, you, if, you the, if, you, you know, if you take the advice that it's the best wisdom that we have in our culture at present is that you know, you, you've either got to be well prepared or you just don't be there, you've got to leave early. You seem to be quite touched by the plight of the emergency services personnel who did their best on the day. That was one of the sadder things I found, that almost all of the essential services people I spoke to, be they police, rangers or um, you know, CFA, very often they felt, particularly those who had been really badly hit themselves, felt a sense of guilt as if they'd some well they'd been out there heroically doing you know, trying to defend their communities. It obviously had still been a disaster and a lot of them seemed to carry a you know, a certain guilt. And and often because of the sort of people who contribute to community organisations that are you know, very good hearted people, they will feel it, they sort of feel a sense of failure. Uh, from what descriptions of what other people had given to me, it did seem that there were quite a few people who did behave very heroic, which is why I decided to focus on it. 
either handful. So we do need to acknowledge that, I think, and give them the respect that, that, that they deserve, particularly given that most of those people who perform those heroic deeds did come out of it pretty badly, they came out of it pretty scarred. A lot of them had a lot of them had um, you know, psychological trauma and post traumatic stress and things like this. And we're also very worried about their own families and so on. And, and also, in a sense, in, in some ways, they were, it was their job to sort of make up for the, for the failure of the rest of us. The first sentence in your book is, we were lucky at first. The last is, what are the odds? Do you feel that we've learned from the past? It's a reflection on how the fire has changed the way some of the people involved think about the bush and the fact that they're sort of more aware of it being just an eternal, a fire as being an eternal... Um, just a component of that world we're going to have to live with. We, we discussed a, a musical uh, comedy written by one of the most deeply affected people of the community and, and what a heart, heart-rending and you know, bravura performance it was. I say a few metres from the bush, the bush is, a few metres from the hall, the bush is stirring. Tendrils, trist, tendrils twist and creep. Triffid like buds are bursting, seeds are responding with astonishing alacrity to the twin forces of fire and water. The growth this year has a wild profusion most observers have never seen. Looks like an oil slick to me now, comments firefighter Di McLeod as she surveys the lush new growth. A year or two the fire threat will be worse than ever. In millions of homes across the country, Residents switch off the television, adjust the air con, kill the lights and slip into bed. Some on the fringes of the city might spare a thought for the looming summer and its threats, but few will do much about it. Really, what are the odds? So I suppose we're just harking back to the idea that, I suppose in one sense that people like the firefighter Di McLeod have sort of been somehow to carry the carry a burden from the rest of us because she was also, you know, very much involved in the defence of, of the community there, but for the bulk of our society, we're just not taking it seriously, and we've, well, sadly, many of us will fail to learn the lessons, which is of, of Black Saturday, which is why I wrote the book really to try and bring those lessons home to a wider audience.